So, Joe Biden is uh, 77 years old. He was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I'm going to give you some uh, biographical details. Uh, terrible, terrible. Scranton, PA. I- I'm a big Office fan like the rest of America. Do you guys like The Office? No. Yep. How do you not like The Office, Harry? Harry doesn't like anything. I've watched a few episodes. I've actually been to Scranton, Pennsylvania. I just... I just, I don't know. I remember Scranton, Pennsylvania more for a Harry Chapin song back in the uh, 70s. So. Ah. so so Joe Biden, 77 years old. He is uh, in 1953. They moved from Delaware to to Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, uh, Trump recently said that Biden abandoned Pennsylvania and Biden was like, I was in third grade. <laughs> Um, so he graduated from Syracuse University. Uh, so he graduated, excuse me, from the University of Delaware with a double major in history and political science in 65. He was 506 out of 60, 688 in his class. And uh, he went to Syracuse Law School and he finished 76 out of 85. Uh, now, Biden also had a, a terrible stutter, which he didn't really get under control and tame until uh, his late twenties, he would spend hours reciting poetry in front of the mirror, and I think that's Reinhold why he makes a lot of these gaffes. There's still he st- still says that I will fall prey to it if I am uh, tired. So there's still probably a little bit of that. Well, and he's he's getting older. I mean, it's going to be harder to mentally focus enough to prevent the stuttering or the misspeaking that sort of thing that's that goes on. So as you as you kind of get older and you start declining as I can attest, it becomes harder sometimes to, to have the same amount of focus and, and um, energy that you did when you were younger. So that's probably, I, I would imagine that that's probably just going to get worse for the rest of his, uh, his life. Now, during his first year at Syracuse, Biden was accused of plagiarizing five of 15 pages of a law review article and he failed a course and had to retake it. Now, this is how far we've come in terms of presidential scandals. Because when Joe Biden ran in 87, 88, the revelation that he plagiarized in college, you know, uh, 20 years earlier, sunk his presidential campaign. Harry, contrast that with grabber by the you know. It's uh, slightly leaps and bounds different. Um, only I'm going to for that guy now. He's grabbing by the P. <laughs> <laughs> Not that plagiarist. Oh, man, I can't believe plagiarist. <laughs> just, well, I, I think the other thing is just because probably a lot of people who voted for uh, Trump because he grabs him by the P, probably also plagiarized. You know, allegedly. I don't know if they did or not, but it sounds like people who got a Wikipedia did copy and paste. Or or had somebody buy, uh, take his SATs for him. At least he didn't yeah. know that, right? Oh, but <laughs> there's no proof in that, right? Oh, there's no proof. There's an accusation. Uh, so, so that sunk his his career. Let me um, let me read this from his website. Such a quaint time. Biden, who has served in public life for around half a century, is emphasizing his government experience, seeking to cast himself as a steady, seasoned hand in a dangerous and uncertain world. As the coronavirus crisis has unfolded, he has looked for ways to help voters. Picture him as a commander in chief, formulating recommendations rooted in advice from healthcare and economic experts. Those suggestions, including making coronavirus tests broadly accessible and free. He has said that there should be no out of pocket costs for patients to receive an eventual vaccine either. And he has been sharply critical of Trump's response to the virus, accusing him of acting too slowly. Biden who served as vice president under Obama during the passage of the Affordable Care Act and health care remains a top priority for him. It's an issue he often discusses in the context of his family's personal tragedies. He lost his first wife and infant daughter in a car accident in 1972, and in 2015, his son, Beau Biden, died of brain cancer. Health care, he said, is an, in an early television ad, is personal to him. He supports adding a public option to the Affordable Care Act, but opposes Medicare for all, the sweeping single-payer me- measure advocated by some progressives in his party, including Mr. Sanders. Biden, who served for the Senate 
in, in the Senate for decades firmly believes in the value of bipartisanship and insists on extending overtures to Republicans, even in a moment when many in his own party don't see negotiating partners on the other side. As a former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he also speaks passionately about asserting and defending America's role as a leader on the global stage. Now, I said that was from his campaign website, and I'm sort of right. That was actually his biography on the New York Times. Mm. Hard-hitting journalism. Yes. Hey, geography, as uh, it may, may be uh, referred to. But that gives you a brief overview of uh, they're going to drag this guy across the finish line. <laughs> um, so, you know, his early political career. So after graduating from law school, he started practicing law as a public defender and uh, then for a, a firm uh, headed by lo an active local Democrat, he was a Republican. And then he was disgusted by some local shenanigans and, and registered as an independent and eventually ended up switching to the Democratic Party. Um, and it was around this time when he switched. And so at the end of 69. Now, I should also mention he also led a sit in and in the late 60s when he was in high school. So he, he was politically active and politically minded. Even back then, he he told his first wife, I'm going to run for Senate and then I'm going to run for president. Uh, so he and this is when he was, you know, in his mid 20s. So he's been single minded for for such a long time. So at the end of 69, he ran to represent the fourth district on the new castle, new castle county council, uh, a usually Republican district. He served on that county council from 70 to 72 and so he ended up uh, in, he ended up working his tail off to win this county council seat uh, in Newcastle, uh, Delaware. And it's like a heavily, heavily Republican district. And he ended up winning by 60, 70 percent of the vote in that first go round. So, you know, he his hallmark has always been, you know, shaking the babies and slapping hands or however that goes, uh, kissing hands and shaking the babies. Right. And he, just getting out there, the retail politics, the schmoozing with people. You know, he's the son. His, his father was in the oil industry, and then kind of went south. He did not grow up with me. Uh, by um, he was not a rich guy. He's never been a rich guy. He really didn't make any money until the end of the Obama administration when he published a book. Mm -hmm. You know, he always lived in a very modest house in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, which is kind of outside of. Uh, Philadelphia. When I took a trip to Philadelphia, I accidentally ended up at the Joe Biden Amtrak station because that's the station that he would ride to Washington, D.C. in all of the time. Like he was his persona. And I don't think that this was a put on. You guys tell me what you think about your perception of Joe Biden. His persona in Washington, D.C. was I'm just Joe. I'm just a regular hardworking guy. I'm not about all these pretenses and I'm not, you know, he you know, even now during the campaign, he's at home, staying at home for the most part. He has two aides, his traveling aide and his chief of staff from his Senate days and Obama days. They come to the house. But most of the time, he's just hanging out at the house alone, having dinner with his wife and then on the campaign trail virtually. Most of the time, most of these guys would have staff there 24-7. You know, they would have a lot of demands. They wouldn't be doing any. He's just picking up the phone, calling a lot of people like his his thing. And I don't think it's shtick. I think it truly is him is that he doesn't he wants to be the anti senator, you know, and that's why he can, has always connected with blue collar people, because that's where he came from. I'm a poor guy from Delaware. I grew up that way and I don't want to change. And and I think that's probably accurate as uh, and real. Um, I think a lot of it has to do too. I mean, I think he had ambitions when he was younger. He's going to be a senator, then be president, right? Um, but I think the—I don't know if a lot of people really understand, but I think the death of his first wife and his uh, daughter really affected him in a way that kept him from getting a swelled head and keeping mm -hmm. himself grounded. When when they talk about him riding the Amtrak into D.C. That was because he was staying home and taking care of his family, his kids, because instead of having a house in D.C. like a lot of senators do, where they just live there and they party and do all that stuff, he would go home every night and take care of the family. So he never he never got caught up in all of that, um, that type of environment in D.C. either. Um, how much of that is, you know, political posturing and how much of that is his real life? I mean, I, I don't think you can get away with it as long as he has if it wasn't real 
you know, at least well, at least somewhat yeah. grounded in right. reality. Yeah. So we'll talk about the the Senate. Go ahead, Harry. I was going to say, yeah, in our earlier characterizations of Joe Biden, even during the Obama administration was, this is the grounded, down-to-earth Joe Biden surrounded by millionaires. You know, when he right. was in the Senate, it's like, he is surrounded by millionaires. Everyone's in there is a millionaire, probably except him, you know? And it's, you know, and you... Were you on the show the time that we talked about how they had to figure out a guard shack for his house in Wilmington because it was, like, just on a regular Philly-type block? You know, it was just like a regular four story or four room house. And, you know, there was nowhere to put like a, a place to guard the vice president when he wanted to go to his house. And, and he finally was able to build like a, a more pastoral scene where he's hanging out now. But you know, it was really inconvenient because the guy lived a very like non-assuming lifestyle. Well, okay. they said, too, he was always the poorest senator. Yeah. Whenever yeah. they did the uh, how much net worth everybody had, he was mm -hmm. always at the bottom. Well, Ron Paul had golds um, and wasn't a senator, sorry. But uh, the, the, the I don't remember if I was on the episode, but it's kind of weird because I can't remember hearing it on the show, but I don't know if I was on the show or not. Right. Sorry, that's, it's very It's like a weird memory right now. Oh, that's weird. It's like he's the opposite of Bernie Sanders, who has three houses. You know, like he, he didn't cash in and he didn't really try to seek his position to cash in. And so kudos to him on that. We'll give him points on that stuff. But it's Vermont, okay? Right, right. Well, people in Vermont and New Hampshire, ha if you have a bunch of, if you've stayed up there and watched your money, you will have two houses living in Vermont and New Hampshire. Now, you, you mentioned a very foundational moment because be after his election to the Senate, which we'll talk about in a moment, before his swearing in, there was a car accident where his three kids and his wife were driving and were hit by a truck that was carrying corn cobs. And uh, it was a semi truck and it hit the car. It killed his infant daughter. It killed his wife. In 1972, um, Bo and Hunter were both injured, and uh, at the swearing-in ceremony, it, you know, Bo is in a wheelchair with a cast on his leg, and he was a single dad. And so, in his first years as senator, all of his staff said, "There's no way this guy's going to last because he was just checked out mentally. I mean, he was um, just really struggling to do the job because he was, you know, mourning and grieving." He was taking care of his two sons. He was trying to keep their lives as normal as possible. He had some family help. And he had a rule that it does not matter if I am interviewing the president of the United States on the Senate floor. If my boys call, you come get me. And they take priority. And I think that's probably why he stayed in Delaware. It is a short commute. It's you know an hour or two commute. But to give them some sense of normalcy after they lost their mom. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that was so. In 1972, uh, he decides to run for Senate, and and it was one of those things where there was a very long time Republican senator in the seat, J. Caleb Boggs, and he had decided he was waffling on whether or not to run in '72 and hold the seat. And uh, Nixon convinced him in '72 to, to, to we'll give you full party support, please run. Uh, we need you to hold the seat because in '72 that was in the middle of Watergate, and there was an absolute bloodbath. Um, or was that 74 when there was the big waves? I thought 72. So, 72, he won in a landslide. The Watergate came out after the election in 72, and it didn't really hit till 74. Okay. All right. So uh, 74 was when like uh, Luger ran and lost to, to Birch by it. So that, I was getting that all confused. So um, a U.S. rep. Pete DuPont and Wilmington Mayor Henry Haskell Jr. were going to have a divisive primary fight, and that was going to possibly tip it to the Democrats. And that's why uh, Nixon got involved and asked uh, this guy to Boggs to run again. And uh, so Biden was the only one that stepped up. You know, one of those races in your home state or hometown where it's like you're the fool who's just going to give it a shot. You know, you're going to lose. He wanted to run, mm -hmm. start building some connections. He uh, grassroots campaigned again. His sister ran the campaign, Valerie Biden Owens, and they focused on withdrawals from Vietnam, the environment, civil rights, mass transit, more equitable taxation and health care. And he won at 30 years old, which is the cutoff for a senator. He was the sixth youngest senator elected to the Senate, at his swearing in, and he won by 3,162 votes. Um, and so... He became, you know, he served in the Senate until 2009 when he became the vice president. And he has been on your dole uh, until until the last few years. 